Hi, and thank you for joining us here in the customer lounge. Uh, in a moment, we're going to go through into the main showroom and have a look at the cars that we have currently offer for sale. Uh, there are some cars here also on storage or um, off-market sales um, that include the MGPB and the Austin Healey uh, 100M. Um, we've got a few more cars as well which are never displayed but are available to purchase but they're kind of in the background. So without taking any more of your time up, we'll go into the showroom now and we'll go through every single one of the cars individually um, and I hope you enjoy what you see. This particular car is a 1934 NB. Uh, it's the second of the N series, the NA being the original, which the MG Bellevue is based on an NA, NA chassis, and we'll get to that later. But this is a um, NB, as I say. It's a, a four-seater Magna. Um, it's got a six-cylinder um, engine, which was derived from the walls of the Hornets. Um, the CC is 1275. Car's in exceptional condition, uh, being restored in Australia in 2009. It was shipped back to Ireland um, in the 2000s um, and it's been residing with the owner in Ireland uh, since then, uh, where he had bought it from, from Barry Walker, the MG specialist. As you can see, the car's in fabulous condition. It's an all-matching numbers car and the body frame was replaced during the restoration. Um, because it was deemed uneconomical to repair um, and the condition is, is fabulous. Um, the car is on the button and ready to be used and enjoyed by its next custodian. We have the MG PA Q-Type. This is quite a fascinating car actually, the history for this car. The chassis was originally um, laid down in 1935 and it was first registered with Cheshire Constabulary with a four seat body just like the uh, NB alongside me. And then the Smith family joined I think 2015-16. Once they uh, found the parts they decided to build uh, a Q-type replica. The MG garage, MG factory made nine original Q-types and the Q-type continued with the PA engine uh, with a compressor, a supercharger fitted to the front and then it had this very attractive two-seat body with a, a bow tail and with twin fuel tanks. Built for, for with competition in mind, it was a very light nimble car and was extremely competitive uh, in period. Now um, this particular car, whilst they were building it as a, a Q-type, they actually differed from the Q-type speci specification and they fitted a six-cylinder NA engine, which is 1275cc, again with the supercharger. This is a modern Volumex supercharger, so extremely efficient, putting the power from the carburetor at the front here through the supercharger, then through this pipe here to the inlet manifold. Inlet manifold into the head and it's blowing, I seem to think it's blowing at, um, where is it? We're blowing at about four, four to six uh, um, PSI, which is plenty ample for a light competition uh, stroke road car. Any more than that, you start to affect re reliability. It's a great car on the road. You could almost say it's very similar in performance, in fact it's probably quicker than a, a K3, which was another of um, MG's sporting um, cars. So you've got um, a lightweight a a PA chassis with uh, hydraulic brakes, so you've got really good stopping power, and then that 1275 six cylinder supercharged engine, so this car really motors along. Um, and it's extremely attractive, and again, highly finished. Uh, a sister car to the PA, which was the follow-on car from the PA was the PB, which gave you a 950cc engine. Um, again, four cylinders, um, following on what they'd, they'd done on the PA. Uh, lovely, attractive two-seater body. This car was one of four cars laid down uh, on that day by the, um, 
by the MG factory. I originally finished in black with silver wheels. In fact, all the MGs in here have silver wheels, um, which is quite uh, an, in well, it's a useless bit of information, but it's quite nice to have. Um, originally, it had a green interior, but this uh, has a, an oxblood uh, maroon interior, an oxblood leather, which is, is not new leather, it's been there for a while and it just, it has a really nice lived in feel. Um, good usable car, eligible for a whole host of events, so uh, Le Mans Classic, which we've got next year, uh, also Midland Millia eligible, um, but it's just a great car to go touring in and enjoy uh, for the sake of enjoyment. Um, the engine block on this was fitted uh, with a brand new engine block in 2011 by Bainton Jones. We still have the original block that will go with the car as well, so kind of 3D part of its history uh, to go alongside its history file. So I think we should cap off the MGs with the uh, Bellevue Special, uh, a car owned by uh, a client of ours, Michael Barber. Um, fascinating history was built by Bellevue Garages in 1937 uh, and an employee of theirs, Wilkie Wilkinson. Now Wilkie had joined the Evanses at Bellevue in 37 and they needed a competition car to promote the business. So it was selected that a uh, 1935 car that um, was already owned by the Evanses was to be altered. Um, they decided they were going to enter the Empire Trophy in 37, which was at Donington Park. Um, and the car was stripped down to bare chassis and a single seater had to be built. Now, the, the driver's seat, a lot of people say to me, how does the, why is the body offset? Well, the body's offset because the, the driver still sits in the original right-hand driving position and they've offset the body from the, the center of the front down through the back. So the passenger sits to the, sorry, the driver sits to the right of the transmission tunnel, still at the natural road height. Originally 1100cc uh, with six Amal carburetors, which I still have those Amal carburetors with the car and the original 1100 block. The car's now sporting a uh, supercharger, which is a Marshall blower, which was uh, a similar blower to this. Um, was fitted to the car in 1950 or 49, uh, 1950 by uh, Basil Delisa, who was the en then owner of the vehicle. Basil uh, needed more performance at Goodwood, so for the, the members meeting, he'd fitted the uh, Marshall Supercharger. Um, it's a fabulous car, as I think, um, who was it? It may have been, um, I think it was Duncan Potter or Mark Dalton said to me at um, Prescott Long Course last year that it's actually the most campaigned historic racing MG that's currently around today. Um, and I have the pleasure of using and driving the car because um, Michael can't fit in it. Um, and I'm out nearly every other weekend throughout the summer in the car, enjoying it and improving, improving it as the best we can. We've done many modifications over our ownership or Michael's ownership. We've beefed up the gearbox, changed the chassis color to Bellevue Blue. I keep toying with the idea of painting the whole car uh, this Bellevue Blue, but I haven't quite got the uh, bottle to do it just yet. We have had um, various development um, periods over the car, and I think it's performing as well, if not better than it has ever done before. So that's the Bellevue Special. Um, and then we go on to the Alvis 1260. This is our fourth or fifth 1260 beta back by car bodies in the last 12, 18 months. This is um, an exceptional vehicle. Uh, it's matching numbers. Um, it is quite nice because it's actually got a bit of patina about it. The body was painted by Red Triangle uh, probably 10 years ago or so. So that's still got a nice sheen to it but also showing some of its uh, road miles. The leather interior, uh, that dates back from the 60s, and we even think the uh, door card pockets could be the original. I'm not fully convinced on that, but um, that, that's what the, I've been told by uh, past owners. Um, but the interior has a nice lived-in 
uh, mature feel, but it's not worn out. The car performs beautifully. In fact, it's probably one of the best performing of the 1260 diesel backs we've had uh, with by car bodies. It was rebodied um, in the 60s. Um, it was taken off the road and had a, a stripped down rebuild, which we, you can see photos in the file. And it was reskinned in aluminium as opposed to steel. So we've got aluminium wings, aluminium body. So it's that much lighter than the all um, original bodied, car bodied cars. So great fun thing. And also unlike the other um, diesel backs we've had, this one still has its um, seat squab in the rear, so you can put that grandchild or mother-in-law in the back if you so desire. So, great fun. And then we're going to the um, back store area where we've got the rest of our cars. So here we have, as we walk into the, uh, the back storeroom, is uh, a 1935 Aston Martin. Aston Martin, fabulous brand, been going since 1913 and still today building two four-seat sports cars, which is essentially what we have here now. Uh, 1935 car, as I say, Mark II short wheelbase, so you've got the slab tank on the back, um, rear-mounted spare wheel uh, with a 2 plus 2 um, seating arrangement. Uh, but it's more of a, a luggage area in, in all real, realism. Great touring car, um, full hood, wet weather gear, tonneau that goes with the car as well. This car is fitted, it, uh, finished to the original factory um, build sheet. So we've got the uh, brown interior with the burgundy exterior. It was first uh, ordered by a Mr. Birmingham in Palmall, Palmall in London. Uh, he was a hotelier and it would have looked fantastic sitting out of his hotel, outside his hotel in the 1930s. So this car has its own history, like all of them. And in, 20, no, in 2009, um, the car was bought by the vendor from RM Auctions in uh, Texas, where the car was being auctioned off as part of the paint collection. The car was on display there in, in barn fine condition. Uh, finished in dark blue with grey leather, looking very, very um, in need of um, restoration or um, revival. So Curie Batelli did the restoration and what they did, they, they took the engine out of the car that was dispatched to a Curie. Um, the crank was shown to be uh, worn out, so a new crank was fitted, one of their new modern steel cranks, which involves some machining of the original block. When I say the original block, uh, this block was actually fitted in 1947 by the Aston Martin Works, the original um, having um, been deemed to be um, defective, which was quite uh, common in those days with the, the Aston Martin Mark II engines. Um, so we're still at 1500 cc, car's very much on the button and enjoyable to drive um, and yeah it'll look great in somebody's collection. So from the Aston Martin we go to another two seat sports car, probably lesser known as a mark uh, is Fraser Nash. Fraser Nash, brilliant sports car of the day, um, sadly not really uh, a, a model that people will understand um, outside the pre-war fraternity. Um, but an amazing vehicle. What Fraser Nash had was quite a, a novel way of changing gear. So instead of having a conventional gearbox in the back here, they had a chain drive system. So the differential, essentially, your um, diff is constantly running. And in here we have four gear chains. And to change gear, you use the outside selector as on this car and there's dogs like teeth, so they've got three teeth, and the cons one set's constantly running, and when you want the next gear, you f with the gear lever, you move across the selector, so the teeth engage, so you can actually change gear without uh, using the clutch. You've also got a solid rear axle, so both wheels are turning at the same time, which doesn't help with steering, it kind of wants to push the front end on, 
So the best way is really to get the back end lit up and go through bend sideways. So great fun car, especially on wet roundabouts. Um, really, I suppose it's drifting in the in the early days, but great fun car. This particular car has its own unique history, uh, as all the cars that we we offer. There's no two pre-war historic cars the same. It just doesn't exist. Each one is unique, be it ownership or the story of the vehicle. With this one, the story of the vehicle, um, as illustrated in John Bolster's book uh, on specials, um, the car known as the, the Abbott Nash, and now the Mercedes Nash, was uh, a, a single seater hill climb car throughout most of its life during the 30s. It was the very first Fraser Nash to get a, um, an AC engine. So it's got a two litre, six cylinder, all aluminium AC engine, fitted from the AC Mercedes, hence the Mercedes Nash. Um, we've now got a, a brand new Robin Warmer block and head in here. We still have the original 1937 block, which goes with the car as part of its history, uh, its history file, which on this car is immense. We've got probably two bo big box files of correspondence and, and history. Um, it's mentioned in the John Bolster's book on specials, and the car is actually invited um, in 2020 to Shelsley Walsh as part of their celebrations of Shelsley specials of the day. Um, in fact, in 19. 38 I think it was, um, it's set fastest time of day building, uh, beating Fane in the 3 to 8 uh, BMW, really powerful potent car producing circa 120 brake horsepower through the live uh, transmission into the uh, diff, uh, chain drive dis differential, it just absolutely flies along. This body was fitted in 2015 when the car returned from the States. It had quite a, um, a homemade body on the car and the, the owner at that point, uh, the new owner decided that he wanted the car to look more like a, a Fraser Nash from the factory rather than a homemade special which he'd kind of fallen down the trap into. All that's part of its history, but actually it's quite a nice attractive pointed tail uh, Fraser Nash, which is a rare thing and is a nod to the, the Boulogne um, Fraser Nash that Archie Nash used to drive himself with a nice bit of luggage space in the back there as well. A really usable two-seat sports car. So, 1925 Amalcar 4C, uh, or C4 I should say, Petite Sport. This body was built by Keith Hill by the, um, on request of Mike Tebbit, the then owner. Mike had bought the car in 2007 um, from uh, an individual on the south coast and the uh, the body was falling off the car um, it wasn't really worth res restoring the body that was there and the body was uh, more of a commercial um, as, a, as opposed to a, a usable um, sports car or sporting car um, the 11 the 1000 cc uh, side valve this car we've actually just put a, a decelier a correct decelier uh, starter motor on it, very rare starter motor actually, it took us um, I think about five months, six months to get hold of that uh, and modify it to, to fit on the, the side of the engine. Um, a very uncomplicated engine, so easy to work work on with being side valve, very similar to, a, to an Austin 7 in some respects. Um, talking to Mike at Prescott's uh, this year and he was telling me the mascot, kind of a nod to Lalique, was actually the top of his wife's perfume bottle um, after she'd finished using it, obviously, because um, otherwise that one's gone down well at all. Single door to get in from the passenger side. We've got a three seat speed gearbox, lovely original um, OS instruments, um, 1925 registered, um, just a really nice usable, enjoyable car. Um, what can you not like about it really? Um, just want to go and enjoy. Um, be it on a, a long rally to, to France with friends, with other Amalcar owners, um, or the VSCC in their light car awarding section. They have various events through the year. I think they've got three events next year um, where you could go and join like-minded friends and 
just enjoy the countryside and find restaurants and hotels and, and find company. So that's the Amal car. We fast forward from the Amal car nearly three decades, 1954, and we've got the Austin Healey 100M. So the Austin Healey, probably one of the most archetypal 1950s sports cars um, of, the, of the time, needs little or no introduction. But the 100M side probably needs, does need clarity. So the official production of 100Ms started on the BN2 model, but was available as a BN1 when ordered from Cape Garage or Donald Healey Works at the Cape in Warwick. This particular car we've gone through to the factory records uh, or the records at Warwick and we've confirmed the car was one of 10 cars registered that month, uh, the month of uh, May uh, in 1954 and it was registered in a block, I say a block of 10. The two just after this went for export and the one before it is a certified and uh, well-known um, 100M that has was competed in period. This particular car had more of a sheltered life. The MOTs sort of more or less guarantee that the 29,000 miles showing on the clock here are, is original. Um, we also, the um, heritage certificate also confirmed that the car was registered um, from Don Healy Works to its first owner. Um, which again helps confirm the, the 100M side of things. The M kit gave you a um, louvered bonnet, high lift cam, high compression head and an airbox, which yes, we know is available after market today. Um, you can go and buy them, but I think the, the records beef up the fact that this was uh, an original car produced in 1954. Uh, I say we're 29,000 miles on the clock um, it was originally black and red, but in the 2000s uh, it was converted to this, or restored and painted this lovely shade of green, uh, and the decals fitted at the time. We've just had FIA pa papers put on the car, and there's also an FIA, FIVA certificate with the car as well, so ready to be used in all sorts of international, in all sorts of international rallying. Um, or even something like the middle of Millia. Great car. So keeping along the 1950s theme, we've got a, a 1951, uh, but 54 registered RGS At Atlanta. This is the very first production RGS At Atlanta um, from the newly formed RGS um, At Atlanta Motors. At Atlanta was a pre-war brand, uh, producing cars in the, the late 1930s. Um, but like a, a lot of small manufacturers of that time, uh, they ceased trading. And then Richard Shattuck, or Dick Shattuck as he's better known, got involved um, within the business wanting to build his own sports car brand. And he, he developed uh, a relationship with the owners of uh, At Atlanta Motors, bought the, the rights for it in 1951, and started producing his own sports car. Um, very much a cottage industry based um, car manufacturing uh, car brand what you did you you went to um, uh, rgs at atlanta and you bought a, a effectively the kit uh, including a chassis axles um, and body and then from there you chose your own engine power unit to go in the front this particular car initially had a lincoln v8 um, pre-war um, your Atalanta had uh, a Lincoln uh, engine unit, so the owner, of the, the builder of the car, uh, Norman Wood, who was uh, an engineer who was working alongside um, Dick Shattuck at the time, he fitted a Lincoln motor, V8 motor, early on realised that it was just way too heavy, it was a cast iron block, it was underpowered, it was heavy on the front end and not ideal for motorsport. So that engine was substituted for a, uh, an Aston Martin DB24, rated at 2.6 litres. This engine in the car, not the original engine, but still a DB24 engine, recently um, built and dynoed um, for competition use. Uh, we're producing 245 brake horsepower, which is having driven the car 
on the road is is more than ample for um, both sports car road use and also uh, competition. Um, great history car, car that could really, as I say, do with its own video to go through the entire story of the car. In fact, in the recent book launched by uh, Dick Shattuck's son, Alan, there's five pages um, put to one side just for this one vehicle. I think it was the very first car in period to receive a, an all fiberglass body as well. So, uh, and this is still the original body. Um, a fabulous vehicle uh, needs to be enjoyed and used um, with its with the next custodian, custodian whoever that might be. Um, we're actually in talks with a couple of people at the moment on this car, so hopefully we might see a sold sign on it very soon, unless you, you, you move quickly. Going back to the pre-war theme, and we've got a Speed 25 Alvis. With all Alvises of the time, you would uh, buy your chassis build slot from the factory. Once the chassis had been laid down, it was then dispatched to a body maker. And really you had two main uh, choices uh, in that time. You either had Vandenplar, VDP, or Cross and Ellis. This particular car has been clothed in the Cross and Ellis body, and at point of order, the, the, the new owner, or the, the, the ordering owner, chose three individual options on the car. First of all, uh, this aero screens, which were mounted along the bottom edge of the windscreen, and the scuttle, which is this part from the back of the bonnet through to the passenger compartment, uh, that was raised by an inch and a half again to try and give it that sporty line. Following along that sporty aesthetics, the rear, the hood here, instead of being sitting above the um, the waistline of the car of the bodywork, that was recessed below the the waistline giving it a, a sporty, as I say, a sporty aesthetic. Just more, I think more pleasing to the eye as you stand back and look at the car. It just sits down rather than some, most B25s of this period, the hood just sat there heavily on top of the back of the car, which doesn't really have that um, sporty credentials that the, the owner of this car was wanting at the time when ordered new. It's a, an all matching numbers original car, uh, not the original paintwork, um, that's been recently um, updated uh, with this two-tone two blue, but we've got the original leather here. Um, so this is the original le leather dating from 1937, and I'm sure it's got plenty of stories it can tell from that time. Um, the car's been owned by uh, one particular owner, Mr. Ridley from Shropshire, and he's owned the car on three individual occasions um, during his lifetime, a car that he just loves, but uh, it's now got to a point where he feels it's time for a new custodian to take on the vehicle. Um, the car drives the car drives beautifully. I've done probably 30, 40 miles in the car. Just before it came into stock, we had it checked over um, by a local uh, Alvis um, specialist, Mick Fletcher, and he's given it a, a clean bill of health, um, and it's ready to enjoy and go touring with. So from the um, Speed 25 here, we go to um, the car that's it kind of all started with me, for me, uh, as an enthusiast of pre-war and vintage cars. This is uh, our family car, um, car that my mum used to take me to school in, 1925 Humber 1225. She was known locally as Pat Mansell because she used to fly around the country lanes um, driving the car every day as she did um, as the only driver in the family and this being our only car. Um, great happy school memories. I really need to get it back on the road. I had a steering box issue a few, issue a few years ago and uh, it got put in the corner here and hasn't been touched since. Then finally, the uh, 1932 Riley Mentone. This particular car I've known for over 35 years and more importantly, it was also the uh, car that was on the motor show stand at the Olympia Motor Show in 1932. It was a new model for, for Riley at that time. What it saw was the uh, the body style from the uh, Riley Monaco, 
but fitted with the 12.6 Riley engine, which you also found in the, the MPH Riley. Um, you've got a 1500cc engine under here, six cylinders mated to the Monaco body, giving a really sporty um, family saloon. Very, very enjoyable. We, as a family, we've used the car a couple of times, um, taking the kids out and they've thoroughly enjoyed it. The car, again, I say I've known for 35 years. <coughs> the owner of the car, sadly not well enough these days to enjoy it, has done thousands of road miles in the car. It's won countless concourse events as well. And it's just a, a, an attractive car to look at and enjoy. And I really can't see why it's still on the market. Um, you should really, take advantage of it because uh, it's say not been on the open I don't think it's ever been on the open market and here it is today thank you for spending some time with us this morning and looking around the cars with me uh, I hope you've enjoyed what you've seen and please feel free to get in touch with me directly um, on the phone or via email and we can discuss uh, each one more in depth um, or even better, you're more than welcome to come and look at them and enjoy a coffee with us.